Welcome back. I'm Raul Lowry Contreras of the Contreras Report. We are honored today to have a guest. He's a regular here, Ruben Navarrete. He's from the Washington Post Writers Group, which is a national organization. He writes twice a week columns for the Washington Post Writers Group and covers every political issue that you can think of, social and economic issues as well. He formerly was a reporter and editorial writer, either or, at the uh, San Diego Union, the Arizona Republic, and the Dallas Morning News. He has written for CNN, and he currently writes also for the Daily Beast. Ruben Navarrete is as interested in the government and Washington, D.C. as anyone in the country, with one possible exception, and that's me. I live and breathe the news from Washington, D.C. I've been in politics my whole adult life since I was 21 years old. Ruben Navarrete, let's talk about President Joe Biden and how he has become president and is acting as president today. Welcome, Ruben. Great to be back with you. Thanks, Raul. Okay. Listen, Ruben, when, uh, when Joe Biden became president on January 20th, he had a five or six vote majority in the House a one vote in a tie-breaking situation in the Senate, and he was able to get a couple of things done. But since then, since in the past few months, he's been totally bogged down. He right. hasn't been able to do anything about uh, the uh, bills in front of Congress. The infrastructure bill passed the Senate and is bogged down in the House. He has been unable to put together a deal on a larger social package, which most Americans mm, support individually as individual parts thereof, but not right. the whole thing. So right. where does Joe Biden stand in your eyes right now? He's in bad shape, Raul, and here's why. Um, in some, to some degree, he was always going to end up in this spot. He was going to be in bad shape. Let's talk a little bit about how he got here. He got here by piecing together a coalition of people who don't get along with one another. Uh, he got here by saying that the only thing people had in common when they voted for Joe Biden is they were sick of Donald Trump. I think it's fair to say that Joe Biden has accomplished one great thing already, which is to get rid of Donald Trump, at least for the time being. He may, Donald Trump may come back. Um, so that was already effective. But in order to do that, Raul, he had to piece together a coalition, get the folks on the left wing, the progressives to support him, the moderates. to. It was this patchwork. And the problem is that when you try to govern from that place, everybody comes to you and says, well, you owe me because I voted for you. And it's very difficult to serve everybody. So that was already going to get us to this spot. We were always going to end up in this spot. The thing that's been different is the infrastructure bill has bogged down this administration. And let me explain how this works. You know, from fo having followed politics, guess what a lot of people don't understand? When a president is elected for four years, they really don't have four years to carry out their agenda. They really don't even have two years to carry out their agenda. Because in the second year of their election or their administration, the members of Congress are all going to be out there running for re-election. So here's the hard, the hard news of it. When you get elected president, you only have about six months and in part the first 100 days to really get things done. That's time to pick one thing that you want to pursue. For Barack Obama, it was Obamacare. And for Joe Biden, it was infrastructure. So to the exclusion of everything else, immigration is not going to happen. Nothing else is going to happen. He, Joe Biden put all his eggs in the basket of the infrastructure bill. Now, to your point, this was supposed to be a slam dunk because for years, Republicans have said they agree with Democrats on infrastructure. But somehow this debate got so screwed up that now the Democrats are fighting among themselves over infrastructure. They're trying to get the votes of two Democrats, Kirsten Sinema from Arizona and Joe Manchin from West Virginia. So... Republicans don't really have a seat at the table. They're irrelevant to the process. Don't come away thinking that the reason Joe Biden is failing is because Republicans are keeping him from succeeding. No. The reason he's failing is because Democrats are thwarting him from within. And the coalition that he pieced together to win the election and get rid of Donald Trump has fallen apart. You can't serve two masters. He can't come forward with a bill that's going to make equally happy the moderates and the progressives. I totally agree. And in fact, it's the progressives really drive me up the wall. 
Uh, they're so adamant, you know, they're, the idea that Bernie Sanders, who is a losing presidential candidate, not once, but twice, <laughs> is calling the shots in the Senate. Give me That's a, a very break. good point. He's chairman. He's not even a registered Democrat, and he's yeah. chairman of uh, the committee in charge of all this. And, and that just doesn't make any sense. In my I, view, he it. should have been I, dumped a long time ago. I like what you just said. I like because it. At first glance, it makes sense that why does this somebody who keeps losing, why does he have so much power? But there's another way to look at this, and that is he has power because of the effect he has on his voters. The Bernie supporters, the Bernie fanatics who turned out for Bernie, including Latinos, by the way. Joe, Joe Biden did well with African-Americans, but not well with Latinos. Bernie Sanders did well with Latinos. They used to call him Feel Bernie. Okay, Bernie Sanders did better with Latinos than Joe Biden did. And... The, the degree to which he excites people, that excitement has to go somewhere. So if you want to know why they take care of Bernie and put Bernie at the table and they give let Bernie be the shot caller, it's not because of Bernie. It's because of the people who follow Bernie. It's because of the Bernie maniacs, including many <laughs> Latinos. That's who they're trying to keep happy. You see? Trump, well, the power I, of Donald I Trump, don't know where that's going to go. The power, but... of Donald Trump, the power of Donald Trump role is not Donald Trump as an individual. It's the Trump people. It's the Trump fanatics. It's the Trump voter. They're the ones who run the Republican Party. You see? So it's the Bernie maniacs, the Bernie voters that keep Bernie at the table. I agree with you 100%. When you win elections, you should not be calling the shots. When you lose elections, you should not be calling the shots. But you have supporters, and they want those supporters. Let's talk about Joe Biden and the border. Almost two million people were arrested in uh, the last fiscal year, uh, yeah. which is a record uh, for, uh, that has stood for 20 years. Now, what's interesting is I don't know how well you were following the border 20 years ago when you were a young kid, yeah. but yeah. Uh, 20 years ago, I was very involved with the border because at that time, I was pumping out uh, two columns a week and it was syndicated by creators and then the New York Times. And uh, uh, I had a big market out there and I was pushing this stuff out because I was the only one doing it except for you. And uh, I watched the border very carefully. I've been involved with the border since I crossed it the first time in 1943. But Same. especially in the past uh, 50 years because I worked in Mexico and the U.S. And sometimes I commuted every day of the week uh, between the two countries when I was living in the U.S. and working in Mexico. So Same. the border is very special to me. I cross it all the time. I'm sitting a thousand yards from the border right now. And yeah. when I leave here, I can get up there and get in line and get across uh, real fast because I have a, a special pass. But, but the border has been shut now for almost a year to non-essential travelers from Mexico entering the U.S. Same. American mm -hmm. citizens, green card holders, essential visits by Mexicans, medical, educational, whatever the situation was. Uh, they were the only ones that were allowed to cross the border, which means about half the normal border crossers weren't allowed to cross during the past year. Despite that, some of the lines, some of the, sometimes it took three, four hours to get across at the San Ysidro port of entry, the busiest port of entry in the world uh, by land. Mm -hmm. And so the government has announced, the U.S. government has announced that in uh, uh, three days, November 8th, November 8th, the border will reopen again here uh, and also on the Canadian side. What is your take on that, uh, Ruben? Is that important? Will it pour American dollars into the American businesses on the American side and, and yeah. dollars into the Mexican side? Yeah. So there's two ways to look at the border. Because you come from this region, if you live in San Diego, the border is right there. And there is a lot to be said about how you have to keep the, the flow of traffic along the border in both directions. Pedestrians coming back and forth, spending money, doing jobs, going back at the end of the day. Cars coming in, cars going both directions. It's it's over. You could correct me, but it's probably the last time I heard the figure. It's something like a two to three billion dollars a year economy between uh, Tijuana and San Diego. Um, it, it's huge. But I grew up in Fresno. I grew up in the heartland in, in Norte. Okay, way Norte, up in up in the San Joaquin Valley. 
And there, uh, the border is this far away place. But I did grow up around immigration, obviously, because you're growing up in an agricultural community, which is surviving because of immigrant labor. And Mas Antes, in the 70s and 80s, when I was growing up as a, in elementary school in the 70s, uh, people would go back and forth a lot. And they'd go and they'd make their money here, and they'd go back to Mexico at Christmas, and they'd buy presents and everything, and spend their money, come back again. I'll throw that back and forth. Um, this is a different thing. The column that needs to be written, the conversation you and I need to be having, is how the border has changed. The current crisis on the border forces all Mexicanos to reassess how we feel about the border. Because this is no longer about grandpa coming back and forth. This is about Haitian immigrants, people who, who left Haiti to go to Central, uh, to South America and who lived in Peru and Colombia and now are coming in through Mexico. And there are Mexican Americans and Mexicans in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas saying, this is, you know, we can't have this. This is not what we have in mind. The, the border has become international. The migration flow across the U.S.-Mexico border you now have people who are not Mexican, not Central American, not Latino, who are coming from all over the world, right? And it is very disruptive. And the people who are saying that this thing has to be controlled are Mexicanos, the Mexicans, not the white people who live in Boston, not the white people who live in Seattle, but the people who live in those towns are Mexican American and Mexicans. You know, I'm a Mexican American. My wife is Mexican. She's from Guadalajara. And I got to say, we were both probably alarmed by the, the fact that you have you know, thousands and thousands of Haitians coming through the border. It wasn't meant for that. It's not supposed to happen that way. We're used to Haitians coming to Florida. But how do we deal with the fact that people are coming now from Europe and from Russia and from Asia all along the U.S.-Mexico border? We have to reassess, okay? We are 10 steps behind this conversation as Mexicanos. We have to reassess our border, how we feel about the border, because it's not the same border it used to be in the 70s. So you're, what you're suggesting is that the Biden administration, instead of just p sticking a finger in the leaky dike, really need to reassess the whole border situation and should do it I with, agree. say, uh, a commission, uh, a bipartisan commission with a six-month uh, license yeah. to come up with some real suggestions. You can. You can do that as a task force, a commission, an initiative at, at DHS, the Department of Homeland Security. What I'm saying is that no es como más antes. It's not, I, I've been hearing for many years, I have Mexicanos tell me that immigration had been changing and that it wasn't the same when Mexicans come from Mexico to work, it's a little different than when Haitians are coming or even when Central Americans were coming. You ask most Mexicans, they don't, they don't welcome Central Americans into Mexico, fíjate, let alone into Texas. <laughs> so they feel differently depending on who's crossing. And if you're from El Salvador, or if you're from Honduras or Guatemala, they don't, you're not welcomed by the Mexicans in Texas. And I think we have to confront that. It's not just as simple as let everybody in. And if you're against it, then that's only the white people and they're a bunch of racists. No, the people in Texas are Mexicanos and they're saying <laughs> you can't have the whole world coming through Texas. I think, and that's where, and that's where Biden, I criticize Biden a lot for being like Trump. I have, he's too Trumpy. He's adopting the Trump policies, title 42, he can get rid of people without a hearing. I get it. Uh, every time he's going to be like Trump, I'm going to pound Biden. Okay. But I understand where he's coming from because he's saying, no es como más antes. He's saying we cannot simply have thousands upon thousands of Haitians coming in, 50,000, 100,000 into Del Rio, Texas. No. We're going to wrap up now. Let me just ask you one thing, though. Is Tucker Carlson of Fox News right when he's saying that Biden is importing all these people of color to replace white Americans? No, no. And Tucker, <laughs> Tucker's wrong about a lot of things, but he's he's certainly wrong that it's some sort of a um, of a conspiracy and a planned effort. What if Tucker were right? You would have to think that the Biden administration is very smart and well organized. They sit down with a piece of paper and they say, here's the plan, okay? There's no plan, hombre, there's no plan. It's every day the house is on fire and they're trying to put out the fire with all these people coming across. So Tucker is wrong, despite the offensiveness of that comment, it just doesn't make sense logically that the administration has a grand plan. Now Tucker, what Tucker's point is, is the reason it resonates, Raul, is a lot of white people do feel displaced. Yeah, A lot of white yeah. people in both parties, in both parties, yeah. feel pushed out. 
Yeah, well, Joe Biden should remember that he's not a member of an organized party. He's a Democrat. He's a, Ruben, as a, as thank Will you Rogers, so much. Say. Thank yeah. you so much for being with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, my friend.